Welcome back to another Outdoor Philosophy here on Switched to Linux. So we're continuing our study of the book, The Building a Bridge, uh, Building a Bridge to the 18th Century. And um, this is kind of where we start to get into, he's picking out each of the various types of topics in the world and uh, and addressing them throughout the the rest of the book. And so we have technology, he's going to be talking about technology, language, information, narratives, children, democracy and education. So we are today on the third chapter and we're looking at technology and uh, also included in technology is Appendix 1, the letter of Lord Byron to Lord Holland, February 25th, 1812. Uh, and I'll just comment on that. Um, so as we dive into looking at technology, his fundamental core is to ask, is all of this technology helping our society or is it not? And this is a, a fascinating question as, as this guy was nearing the end of his life and end of his career when this book was written in 1999, having had an entire career warning people about diving too quickly into technology and it's a valid point to be asking um, as Matthew Arnold warns and he he writes this in, in his uh, uh, the beginning of this chapter he warns that faith in machinery is humankind's greatest menace and that's an important thing to recall that just because we can do something doesn't necessarily mean we should do something. So he spends a little bit of time looking at uh, looking at various trends, and it turns out that that in in all of this discussion we're having today about uh, technology and and uh, our our robots and machines going to take over jobs. Curiously, this was actually an issue of debate in 1800s, and in 1812, Byron wrote that um, uh, wrote the the letter to Lord Holland because what was going on is there was a group of people known as the Luddites and the Luddites were being replaced by uh, by machinery so basically it was a group of people that they would go around they were kind of like your zealots in the times of uh, in the Roman days you know the, the the secret assassins these Luddites would go around destroying these machines for good reason that these machines were destroying their jobs and that raised a central question of debate around Around the 1800s, as a law was being uh, was being debated that would make it a capital offense to destroy a machine that has taken your job, and so it's it's interesting to look at you know a lot of these arguments we're having today about about the the robots, the robotic technologies, and all of these. It's a fascinating take, and he'll say in this chapter, you know, we, we talk about the difference between Marx and we talk about uh, uh, Adams and, uh, or uh, excuse me, Adam Smith and, and Wealth of Nations and all this. And, and in Wealth of Nations, you know, he, he's like, you know, and, and it's not just in Wealth of Nations, but in the, the overall societal trend, we're like, you know, most of our society can be done with only 10% of the labor force doing anything, and it raises a fascinating question what are the other 90% doing, particularly in a world where everything costs money? So this is great for the people that own the technologies, like your self-driving cars and all of the other things that we have out there uh, that that we all need to have and have to have and even have government regulation forcing us to buy these things that are owned by private companies. It's really great news for the people up at the top. But, you know, I think it was George Carlin that said, America is like a melting pot. The, the, the uh, people at the bottom get burnt and the scum float up to the top. Um, and that's really where Postman is asking some core questions. So he goes through uh, looking at how the the questions we're asking today about technology are not a lot different than they were asking even in the 17th, 18th, 19th century as the uh, the uh, industrial revolution was starting to generate machines that would start to take more and more people's jobs. And it was always a question, if more machines come in and take over more jobs, what do the rest of the people do? Well, some people get jobs repairing those machines, but that's not nearly as many as, as get displaced. And it's just a question that he is asking throughout. And it's one that, that we need to keep in mind. Um, so, um, I guess the next, the next fascinating part um, 
down here, while acknowledging our self-consciousness, uh, uh, Negro Ponte is impatient with it. He envisions a time when we speak to a doorknob, a toaster, and predicts that when we do, we'll find the experience no more uncomfortable than talking about a telephone answering machine. He has nothing to say about how we may become different by talking to doorknobs and has no clue about how talking to answering machines is far from comfortable. This is fascinating because he uses this analogy of talking to a doorknob throughout a large chunk of this chapter, and I literally think he picked the most absurd technology he could possibly come up with, because I don't believe in his time we were even close to the smart of the IoT technologies that we have. Little did this guy realize that, yeah, only a couple decades after this book is released, we have doorknobs we can talk to. We have devices. In fact, one of the comments that he's uh, he's talking about uh, from from Gates. Let me see if I can find the quote. Uh, it was a very fascinating thing. I want to get to it more directly, but um, literally, he is talking about the very same um, smart technology that we have uh, that we have now. It's a beautiful quote. I have to find it. Here we are. So, I've been told Bill Gates, whose fertile imagination never gives him a moment's rest, dreams of technology, or that would make obsolete the task of locating and then sending recordings into action. One approaches the machinery and speaks the word Frank Sinatra or Pavarotti or, if you can imagine it, the Spice Girls, and we hear them. May one ask, what is the problem solved by this? I have to say at this point in time, Siri, play Spice Girls. Hey Google, play Spice Girls. Alexa, play Spice Girls. I gotta do it. My apologies, people, and my apologies for your ears if you happen to have one of those smart technologies around and it started to play something. This is the very thing he's talking about. He's grabbing the the most absurd things he can think of and they are all being implemented in our culture now. And this leads to what he is asking. The first thing he asks in any new technology, what is the problem to which this technology is the solution? And this raises that question, are we really asking this question? Are we really diving into this? Are we really asking, is it important for us to actually get in here and realize that yes, we should actually have a problem we're trying to solve. We don't just want to do stuff just for the sake of doing stuff and then sell it to a whole bunch of people who have no other purpose than to buy for really not a lot of good. Is it? Now, now, as he goes in here and he's asking this question, obviously there are people that a doorknob you can talk to is an important thing. A paraplegic is now no longer dependent on a, on a person to open the door. He can get near it and say, you know, door open or, or enter a passcode verbally or something like that and, and enter. Uh, that's a great thing. Uh, for that circumstance. My biggest challenge with the technology is not that we have technology that can do that, but that all of that technology that we do that ties into some big company's servers. It's a whole lot better to not have it tied to somebody's server. All right? And that's really the, the point. So that is the question is whose solution are we trying to do? He asks another question about the technology we implement. Which people and in what institutions might be seriously harmed by a technological solution? Realize that there is a lot of harm that can be done by technology. Now at this point he goes through a discussion looking at teachers in education. Of course, we have no problem in this country spending millions of dollars to expand the technological infrastructure infrastructure, buying iPads for every student, getting all this computer technology that, to be honest with you, as myself, a former educator and somebody who is an academic who learns a lot, computer technology can help in a couple of small areas, but it does not teach you any better. In fact, it more often inhibits your teaching. He talks about how we spend millions and even billions of dollars to wire schools. Here's a quote. Will anyone disagree with a claim that we need to have more teachers and we ought to pay more to those we have? Nonetheless, school boards are resistant to hiring more teachers and to paying them more and complain continuously about shortage of funds. This resistance and those complaints notwithstanding the fact that school boards are now preparing to spend the aggregate billions of dollars to wire schools in order to accommodate computer technology and for reasons that are by no means clear. All right. 
Um, so, of course, he, he talks about an article from 1996 in the Washington Post, and he quotes here, quote, Maryland plans to connect every public school to the Internet this year as part of a $53 million effort to give students greater access to far-flung information via computers. Governor Paris and Glending announced yesterday, despite mixed reviews by national analysis who have studied computers in schools, the plan calls for each of Maryland's 1,262 public schools to have at least two computer terminals linked to the internet before winter, and for each classroom to have three to five terminals within five years. So, <clears throat> we're talking about computer terminals to bring in the internet. And I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think if we had internet in our school or not, in high school. Because I would have been in high school around this time. And I don't recall. In fact, I'm guessing we probably didn't. Be otherwise, in even going to the library for our study halls, we probably would have been on the internet looking around at things rather than uh, playing around with paint on the Macintosh. That's my guess. Now, I do recall one computer course <clears throat> in, um, in my senior year of high school, I think, we actually did have the internet. I do distinctly remember going to Excite.com in a computer class in um, in high school. But we had, I think we had one computer lab with like 20 computers that could get on the internet. I think that was the extent of what we happened to have. So this raises that question that Postman's asking, going back to those Luddite, Luddites and the people getting violent because their jobs are being replaced by machines. Our teachers are getting replaced by the internet and it's not helping our students learn. And we're gonna get into that a little bit further down the line. Um, he asks another question about technology. Um, what new problems might be created because we have solved this problem? So this is where he dives into uh, he dives into this this issue of uh, of what does the technology lead us to? What new problems arise? There's actually one other quote I want to pull out on the previous section um, about what would it, what would we do? Uh, he's talking about the introduction of, of high speed trains. You know what would we do with all of this time we save? We can save as much as three hours time by creating supersonic things. What would we do with these three hours? Probably watch television. <laughs> Love that quote. I had to get that in. I'm, apologies for going backwards. But, you know, the first question I asked is what problem is the technology solving? The second is what people and institutions might be seriously harmed by the technology? The next question is what new problems might be created because we have solved this problem? All right. So uh, antibiotics have certainly... Uh, solved some significant problems for most of all people, but in doing so resulted in the weakening of our immune systems. Television solved our uh, several important problems, but in solving them changed the nature of political discourse, leading to a serious decline in literacy and quite possibly made a, the traditional process of socializing children impossible. Um, and then he goes on here, uses two fascinating examples, and I didn't know these ones, but the, mechani uh, the mechanized clock was actually created by Gregorian monks so that they could better time out their prayers throughout the day. And he writes, um, the clock would later be used as an instrument for making money instead of for serving God. If the monks knew this, they might have stuck with their old ways. Um, and of course, Gutenberg uh, created the first printing press. Um, had Gutenberg known that the creating of the printing press would actually collapse the church of which he was a member, maybe he would have continued to make wine instead. Um, and those are all fascinating things because while at the same token, he looks at those in sort of negative ways, I'm going to call him out on this point because it was good that the, holy, that the, the printing press came out and challenged the, the Holy Roman Church because the Holy Holy Roman Church had been walking away from God and that needed fixed and the printing press allowed that to be fixed so much so if you're an e-reader check out the, the project Gutenberg where you can get a lot of your old classic e-books for free um, and obviously utilizing a clock to to better our economy is is not a bad thing and I'm not sure if he specifically says it's a bad thing I just think that he's he's saying here that the monks who created it may have considered that a bad thing I don't know um, but on that topic of what problems might be created, we're talking about the decline of socialization. We're talking about the decline right now with technology, and this is something we can talk about a lot, where we might have GPSs and even we use our cell phones to map locations out. But man, if we lose data on our phone, 
when we're out in the middle of nowhere and the GPS has to do a hiccup and reset, we are lost. Because all of this reliant technology on GPSs or phones or all this has made us incompetent at actually picking up and reading a road map. How many people in our modern society with all these GPSs actually know how to read a road map? And that's why I rely on road maps more than I rely on GPSs. Because the thing's always going to be there. As long as I got the map. Not that I am completely against the GPSs either. I usually run a GPS, just, you know, small little things, but I keep a, a firm knowledge of where I'm going and things like that. So that is the thing. What other problems can we can we create? Of course, with all of our, you know, the creation of social media has caused, in my opinion, that's what caused the decline of the church in America and probably around the world. These are problems that our technologies are seeming to solve these little problems, but then they are showing us uh, more more problems are arising often than, than are solved. We have this over-dependence on technology right now, and it's a sad, sad thing. Um, <clears throat> here's another question he asks. What sort of people and institutions might acquire special economic or political power because of technological changes? Uh, might acquire special political or economic power. This is a fascinating thing and where he gets into this, this issue where he discusses some of the wealth of nations. Um, he provides a theory that gave conceptual relevance to the credibility and the direction which industry was pointing. Specifically, he justified the transformation from small-scale personalized skilled labor to large-scale impersonal mechanized production. Do we need a theory to justify the movement from an in industrial economy to an information economy? We now, uh, excuse me, we know the new technologies make old jobs obsolete while they create new ones, but is it likely the obsolescence will far outstrip the creation of new jobs? Is it possible that the aid of computer technology, 10% of the population will be able to do all the work society requires? If so, what is the rest of the population? Adam Smith does not have an answer to that question, but it is necessary we do. As we move forward with robotic technology, replacing more and more jobs, we have to be asking that question, what do we do with the rest? Is this, we more and more of the technologies are, are produced and so we as a society become integrated into the, the smart cities I talked about on an earlier video? Which, by the way, is all ourselves living in a giant subscription service at the hands of corporate overlords. That is not a good world to be entering into, people. It is not. We need to stop and ask this question before we replace all of our jobs. We can't look down with 75% of our population out of work because a few companies own the technologies that do everything our society does. And then now they, they are now the ones controlling the masses. Which, unfortunately, is where a lot of your big companies are trying to go right now. So we have to ask that question. Um, there is so much in this chapter, by the way. Here's another question. What changes in language are being enforced by new technologies? This is a neat one because uh, what happens is we can see that language and the way we use words and language can shift. And as languages and words that we use shifts... Um, then, then it can cause a change in definitions of words uh, throughout our uh, throughout our our, our progression. Um, <clears throat> and uh, some of the questions, of course, um, and we're going to skip over that point. There's so many fascinating things in here, um, but I want to conclude with this. Um, uh, I actually want to read the last the last um, page and a half of this uh, because it is so good. This is this final conclusion that the author writes, and this is fascinating. You get the idea. I will use technology when I judge it to be in my favor uh, to do so, and I resist being used by it. In some cases, I may have a moral objection, but in most cases, my objection is practical, and reason tells me to measure the results from that point of view. Reason also advises me to urge others to do the same. An example, when I began teaching at NYU, the available instruments of thought and teaching were primitive. Faculty and students could talk, could read, could write. The writing was done the same way I'm writing this chapter, with a pen and a pad. Some used a typewriter, but it was not required. Conversations were almost always about ideas, rarely about technologies used to communicate. After all, what can you say about a pen except that you've run out of ink? 
I do remember a conversation about whether a yellow pad was better than a white pad, but it didn't last very long and it was inconclusive. No one had heard of word processors, internet, an email, or voicemail. Occasionally a teacher would show a movie, but you needed a technician to run the projector and the film always broke. NYU now has more equipment included in the phrase high-tech, and so an 18th century dinosaur is entitled to ask, are things any better? I cannot make any judgments on the transformations, if any, in technology has brought to the hard sciences. I am told that they are impressive, but I know nothing about this. As for the social sciences, humanities, social studies, here is what I have observed. The books professors write aren't any better than they used to be. Their ideas are slightly less interesting. Their conversations definitely less engaging. Aging. Their teaching is about the same. As for students, their writing is worse. Their editing editing is an alien concept to them. They're talking about uh, their talking is about the same, with perhaps a slight decline in grammatical proprietary. Uh, I am told that they have more access to information, but if you ask them what year American independence was proclaimed, most of them do not know, and surprisingly few can, can tell you which planet is third from the sun. All in all, the advance in thought and teaching is about zero, with maybe a two or three yard loss. It gives me no special pleasure to report these observations, because my university spends huge sums of money on high-tech equipment. Strangely, many professors seem to prefer that money be spent on technology instead of on salary increases. I don't know why this is, but here's one possibility. There are always some professors who've run out of ideas or didn't have any to begin with, and by spending their time talking about how their computers work, they can get by without their deficiency being noticed. I don't mean to be unkind, but I can think of no other reason. And that is a fascinating conclusion to this chapter. And the reason that's so fascinating is that it is true. We in America are the lowest of the industrialized world. Maybe not the absolute lowest, but we are absolutely very low on the pedestal of education in our highly technologized world. We have so many technologies, so many advancements. Kids not only have smartphones going to school, they have tablets, they have, they have Chromebooks, they have Google accounts, they have ready access to every single bit of information information you can possibly get and yet our culture produces droves of raving morons that's the final conclusion of it technology has not helped us learn and as I have I was through that period of time when I got my first email address in college I learned through high school without the aid of the internet we moved through college with we had some internet, but not a ton. We still went to the library. We still did research books. We still did projects. We did do our work on computers for those of us that had them, although oftentimes we drafted things on paper first. And then as I've seen the introduction as I went from being a college student to a graduate student to a college professor right at that transition when online learning tools in my field, master in chemistry and all these things, I will answer Neil Postman's question he didn't know. Does technology help in the sciences? Not in the slightest. Students know less and less and less about the subjects they are passing. So much so when I was a professor, I started telling people, I don't care if you've had algebra, I care if you know algebra algebra because our first lab is going to have you deriving from thin air a systems of equations and then solve it. If you can't figure that out, good thing the first lab is within the withdrawal period. You should drop the class and go take algebra again so you know what a system of equations is. Okay, That's the thing. Our technology has not helped us learn better. Our technology has helped us move faster through a curriculum and we have produced faster morons in most cases. And that's kind of where, where we leave the matter. So thank you for watching this very lengthy outdoor philosophy. Um, I hope it was uh, fascinating for you. And I encourage you to pick up a copy of this book. This thing is prophetic. It is crazy how well he has encapsulated where our culture and society is going. Uh, there will be a link to this down in the description below. There's also some Amazon links in the description down below. If you shop on Amazon and want to help support the channel, that's a great way to do it. It doesn't cost you anything extra. Um, there's also uh, Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Tom M. You can find me over there uh, and you also can uh, pick up a t-shirt like this one at shop.switchtolinux.com so thank you for watching i hope you enjoy switching to linux